What up, Misfits? Welcome to the Misfit Heroes Podcast. My name is Chris, and together we are going on a journey. Now, Misfits, this podcast is about people that are trying to change their community for the positive, and teachers and educators fit perfectly into that mix. Without them, I think we'd get stuck on some difficult topics, and we'd have a hard time progressing into new and unique opportunities. My guest tonight is Robert Hayes, a professor that teaches nuclear engineering at North Carolina State University. Now, to many, that's a fairly difficult topic to digest, but he does so in a way that's fun and engaging via TikTok and social media channels. And he's grown to over 41,000 followers during lockdown, bringing a new lease to people that may not have displayed an interest in nuclear science before. But it hasn't come without his pitfalls. Rob is a devout Christian, and he went viral in one of his TikToks about being a Christian who also believes in science. We discuss the future of nuclear science, why Americans have had trouble normalizing nuclear energy, his faith and how it has affected his interactions in the science community, and how tribalism is controlling narratives around the adoption of nuclear energy. Misfits, let's talk big energy. Please welcome Robert Hayes. Playing the Misfit Heroes podcast. Rob, welcome to the Misfit Heroes podcast. I am very excited to talk to you. I love talking to people in education. I just have a tremendous amount of respect for what you guys do. And I really appreciate you coming on and taking the time to talk to me. I know you're a busy guy. So you're clearly a smart guy. Let me explain the tone of this conversation beforehand because... I want to be clear, you're the expert here. So when I was growing up, there was this film called Back to the Future Part 2. I'm not sure if you've ever seen that. Loved it. Yeah, right? Well, there's this guy with a nuclear-powered flying DeLorean car. And as far as I can tell, it was powered by banana peels, empty beer cans, and Diet Pepsi. And he said that it was nuclear. And that was the extent of my nuclear energy education in the in the late 80s and early 90s. So apparently I, I thought that film was a documentary, you know. And uh, so clearly you're the expert here. So <laughs> let's focus on you. You know, when did you get into the field of nuclear science and what made you want to get into nuclear science? Okay. So I, I, I'd always wanted to be a scientist since I was nine. That's when I first decided I wanted to be a scientist. Um, and so, uh, when I went into school, by the time I finally made it into college, my choice was to double major in physics and math. So I love math and I love physics. Um, towards the end of that, I started a family and with a bachelor's in physics and a bachelor's in math, there really weren't a lot of well-paying jobs out there. So I decided to get a master's degree in physics, figured that would help. Turns out it really doesn't help. Um, get a good paying job. I realized that the only people that were getting decent paying jobs right out of college were engineers. And so by that time, I was well into uh, starting my family and decided, uh, well, if I'm going to have to switch over to engineering, it has got to be the coolest, most awesomest form of engineering that exists, or I'm not going to be interested in it. I'm going to bite the bullet. And lo and behold, nuclear engineering was right there. It was like, yep, that'll do. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> nuclear engineering that'll work and so i got my phd in nuclear engineering and never looked back let's talk about nuclear engineering as well because you know speaking of jobs i'm sure that job market is pretty tight i don't know how many nuclear engineers there are <laughs> my students at least the phds they're getting hired before they graduate um wow. the undergraduates as far as i know they're all getting jobs the straight a students they're also getting jobs before they graduate um, even the, the the lower ranked graded students, they're still getting jobs, but they're just getting all the jobs that nobody else wants. <laughs> right. <laughs> Is it more of like a government field? I mean, I just I don't know about your average nuclear engineer position. Ah, so undergraduate students, generally they go into industry. So we still get just about 20 percent of all of our electricity from nuclear energy. OK. And that's just the commercial power production side. There's still the government side for oversight and regulation. And then there's other forms of industry as well. Uh, Well logging, radiography, um, medical applications. So if you're designing an irradiator for medical applications, you're going to have to do the shielding analysis. Or if you're doing transportation packages, or if you're doing any kind of technology that uses uh, radioactivity or ionizing radiation, 
you need expertise in nuclear engineering. It sounds in depth. It's well above my pay grade. But <laughs> when I hear people talk about nuclear energy in particular, you know, it seems as if the first thing I always hear is it's always like nuclear weapons or nuclear war, or nuclear fallout or something like that. So how do we, you know, how do we clear nuclear energy's image a little bit? Good question. Modest. Uh, I've got a, a, a visiting guest from Howard University doing some research with me. You want to say hello? Hello. How are you? He just walked in. Hello. How are you? Good. He's how are you? Howard. He's a he's, he's a physicist there, and he wanted to come and do some really cool research in my lab. So that's what we're doing. Awesome, man. That's exciting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so clearing the name of for nuclear energy, clearing it of its birth defect of atomic energy uh, in the beginning, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it seems like the first thing people think of is like Chernobyl. That's what we were like sort of trained to think of. But from what I understand, nuclear has come a long way. How can we clear the image of nuclear energy? So um, I would offer uh, a slightly different perspective. Okay. Uh, historically, there if you go back a sufficient number of hundreds of years, there were really only two kinds of engineering. There was military engineering and then there was civil engineering. So there was the stuff that you do for military and then the stuff you do for civilian applications. And both of those are just design. It's making things, right? Building things. Um, and nuclear really is the same as all other engineering. In fact, pretty much all technology that we use and take for granted today has military applications. Okay. Right. I mean, yeah, sure. uh, us just uh, zooming right now, you using a microphone, right? All of this technology is used by the military. Um, and so one could vilify it based on that. You could say, you know, using headphones, you know, the military uses headphones, so they're bad. So unless you're willing to look at the actual peaceful uses of technology rather than focusing on military applications, it's not really going to... Uh, to change. If you're, if you have adopted a narrative that, uh, that a particular technology is bad because of military applications, it's going to be difficult to divorce that. Once you've made up your mind that this is for killing people, then that's pretty much the track you're going to be on. And then how would you convince somebody to look at it otherwise? It'd be like somebody that was anti-gun looking at trying to talk to somebody that was pro-gun, right? Or right. second amendment versus anti-second amendment. And being able to have a discourse there, uh, I would not be able to offer a solution as to how to convince one side or the other uh, about the merits of either argument. Um, all I can do personally is look at both sides. And that's what I can do when it comes to nuclear energy is look at both sides. Yes, it, 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 it does have military applications. Um, and yes, it's got amazing, wonderful, almost utopian civil applications. Um, and if somebody is, is, is married to the idea that it's evil because it can be used for the military, well, technically they're right. Um, <laughs> technically that applies to everything, all technology. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. So it appears to be sort of a mindset issue that we've got to wrap our heads around. You know, I recently saw one of your videos where you're talking about fourth generation nuclear technology. I mean, what exactly does that consist of? What's the new, what's the new advancements, the latest, the latest and greatest in nuclear engineering? Oh my goodness. Okay. So I mentioned about 20% of our electricity is, is powered by nuclear energy in the United States right now, right? Yeah. So those reactors were designed in the 60s and built in the 70s. Yeah. So a lot's happened since then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would okay. say. <laughs> a lot. Just a little um, bit. So there are a lot of new ideas on reactor technology and being able to use the old reactor technology in ways that incorporate uh, better materials, uh, more rigorous testing, um, better uh, uh, electronics, better algorithms, uh, better construction, better fuel, better containment, all of these different things that we had technology, some form of technology for back in the 60s with those designs, there we're coming up with new ideas, new ways to do reactors and new ways to do all of these different aspects in ways that are substantially improved. And that would be Gen 4 technology. Clearly, I mean, so much is advanced just in the world in general. You know, I mean, cars are going to electric cars now. I mean, everybody's got a smartphone in their pocket. It would only make sense that, you know, 
everything else would sort of catch up to that. Now, do you feel that maybe we're sort of playing the cart before the horse? Because with everything going electric, like electric vehicles, for example, do you think that we need more of our power infrastructure to come from nuclear? Absolutely. So, I mean, there is a little bit of benefit you get um, by using electric cars that get electricity off the grid that's powered by fossil, right? Um, There's a little bit of benefit. The big benefit would be to make that electricity on the grid that powers the electric cars be non-greenhouse gas emitting. Sure. Um, and so as long as we're manufacturing the cars with fossil fuels and basically powering the cars by fossil fuels, there's not as much bang for your buck as you really want by getting off of fossil fuels. Does that make sense? Yeah. But we make the steel with fossil fuels. We make the glass with fossil fuels. We make the electronics with fossil fuels. We make the tires, we make all, pretty much all of it is, is, is made with, the majority of it is with fossil fuels. And so until we make the grid basically greenhouse gas free, that's not going to happen. And right now, when we put on wind, the majority of any new uh, gigawatt scale wind or they are comparable there and two, it's always being backed up with, with natural gas. Natural gas is cheap. Sure. And so you can get all of that wind power but in order to supply energy when the sun's not shining and the, and the wind's not blowing for the solar and the wind, you, it's been natural gas simply because it's economical. But it's still not the, the, the bang for your buck that you want because, you know, the base load there is still coming from fossil fuels. And rather than nuclear, and largely it's because of radiophobia. People are afraid of nuclear. They think it's, you know, Armageddon. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's death and, 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 and Hades and so forth evil and incarnate to have nuclear. And so they oppose it. And so they vote for people that oppose it. And when people are voted in that are decision makers, they do what their constituents want and they oppose it. Yeah. You know, one thing that I've noticed, um, regardless of any type of political affiliation or anything like that, it seems like a lot of other countries are adopting a more nuclear um, approach, a, a much more nuclear friendly approach to their, to their, um, entire infrastructure you know is america late to that game and if so i mean is it just a political ideal or a, a mindset issue or what do you th what do you think is the the hold up with that so it comes down to so the research there's been research on it and it's a form of tribalism yeah. that uh once that gets folded into a tribalistic narrative it's very difficult to uproot it because it becomes associated with political worldview Okay. And uh, historically, the Democratic Party did not favor nuclear energy, but they recently did change their political platform to include nuclear energy. So that was a big shift that they changed their party. And there are Democrats that completely support it. Okay. Cory Booker, for example, is very pro-nuclear, um, but he's a minority voice in, in Congress and in the, in the, in the decision-making uh, realms. And so once you have that that narrative, uh, overcoming that can be very difficult, sure. right? Yeah. Um, uh, for example, you could say you, the, the similar kind of arguments could be made about using masks or vaccinations. It's a very, very modern thing to talk about. How do you get people to talk to each other that are on other sides of that fence? And it's a similar kind of a thing with nuclear. Somebody's very anti-nuclear. They're really only willing to listen to anti-nuclear narratives and arguments. If somebody's very pro-nuclear, you got the similar issue. It's going to be difficult for them to hear anti-nuclear narratives. Right. I would like to think, at least from my experience, that people that are pro-nuclear are extremely familiar with the anti-nuclear narratives because that tends to be the loudest voice in any room uh, as a general rule. And so that, that those are very well known and you can list them off, right? Chernobyl, Fukushima, Three Mile Island uh, and uh, Hiroshima. And yeah. that's like the big talking points. Nuclear waste is another one. And once you list off those bullets, usually people think that that ends all conversation uh, when they offer those bullets, even though they don't really understand the science behind it. Uh, but to them, that's a conclusive argument. And being able to talk to them about that is something that would require, again, being willing, the person being willing to challenge their own narrative. Right. So it sounds like they've kind of made up their mind before they even talk to you about it, right? Well, I, yeah, I think that's our nature. I think that's what the anthropologists and the social biologists and the social scientists tell us is that it's, it, it, it's our nature to adopt a narrative so that we can work together.
right? So that we can all be a single team or single group. You know, I have to have a common mission or a common goal or a common worldview. And so it's our nature to adopt something like that so that we can work together so that we're not all by ourselves. I think that has a lot to do with the nature of progress as well. You know, we're not going to get anywhere as a country. I mean, we've got what, 385 million people, something like that. Last time I checked in this country and we're not going to get anywhere if everybody is just going branching out, you know, um, you, you got to come together at some point with something like that. Um, Let's talk about you as an educator as well. You know, um, you, you've been doing this a long time. Do you find that there is like a, uh, a boundary to introducing more people to your, uh, to your craft? Or, or um, how, how can we get more people educated about your field? And is there sort of a growth in science in general? So I recently was introduced to some new research out of uh, – London College by a, a colleague named Malcolm Gristam, because I'd been listening to uh, arguments for a very long time about how to get people to adopt uh, fact, fact, fact-based fact narratives rather than uh, fear-based narratives. Sure. And um, his, his perspective, I thought was very refreshing. Um, uh, the way that he would put it is to say, uh, the reason that a person like me became an engineer is because I think in terms of facts and empirical science and observation. And so that's why, because that's the way I'm wired to think, that's why I became an engineer. Uh, people that don't do that uh, would be more emotional based or uh, more to the point using, they would, they would bias their opinions on common sense. And so if something feels right, what's in the gut? What does your gut tell you? Does that sound right? Does that make sense? And yeah. that would be the more common way to evaluate uh, information is this common sense approach. For example, when it comes to nuclear waste, this person says, so you say you can safely handle this stuff, that uh, there's only a little bit of it, um, and it's something that's that's really easy to deal with uh, and to make safe. That's what you claim, and yet you say you want to dig a hole a half a mile down in the ground and bury it and keep it away from civilization for tens of thousands of years? <laughs> that doesn't sound right. It sounds like you're you're not telling me the whole story here. But in order to to bridge that gap, you say, well, that's because we took this radioactive material from the earth and we concentrated it to an extremely high degree. And then we ap- rapidly accelerated the radioactive decay process by fissioning it. And when we did that, that made it much more radioactive than it was. And so rather than diluting it like it was when we got it, and then putting it back in the environment. So it's only a small, tiny, itsy bitchy, minuscule fraction of the actual radioactivity that's in the earth. Rather than do that, we keep it concentrated. Just like we all waste, right? All waste, you pretty much, almost without exception, everything comes from the earth, right? Unless we get some asteroids, everything comes from the earth, everything that we make. And so all the waste that's generated originally came from the earth in some form. Right. But we don't dilute it and break it up into tiny little bits and just scatter it back out into the earth. We say, well, I'm going to keep it concentrated and dispose of it in that way so that I don't abuse this privilege of being able to use the earth and then dispose of it in a responsible way, like a hazardous waste disposal facility or even just a a sanitary landfill. Right. The trash in your kitchen trash can goes to a sanitary landfill. We don't crush it up and then throw it out all over the earth or whatever. Right. right. Keep it concentrated. And by keeping it concentrated, we put it someplace safe. And then somebody will say, well, then let's put it in your backyard. It was like, well, you know, actually, I would rather I would absolutely unequivocally rather have a nuclear waste repository in my backyard than a sanitary landfill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I used to work at one. And I know the difference There's a huge difference. A sanitary landfill, it stinks, it's messy, it's dirty. But a nuclear waste repository, it's clean, it's professional, and uh, it brings in very well paying jobs. Um, but until you bridge that with the facts, right, to get that narrative, this perspective, and the same applies with all the other ar- arguments, Fukushima, Hiroshima, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, right? You, you have these stories, right? If, if, if the release from Fukushima, as, as, as another example, uh, the, the United Nations put together an expert panel to assess the health, fix, uh, the health effects of Fukushima, and they said the radioactivity release was too small, even if they hadn't evacuated, it would have been too small to produce measurable medical effects. Well, then why did everybody have to evacuate? Right. Right. That's this cognitive dissonance that comes in to somebody that's using common sense to assess the facts. 
Right. And the facts are that when we do these kinds of things, we're being hyper conservative. That's why nuclear power plants are so safe because we're hyper conservative when we build them. But that hyper conservative makes them expensive, makes them slow to build. And so people are, again, you come back with this paradigm saying, if nuclear is so safe, why is it so expensive for all these safety features? Right. But that's why they're so safe because we spend so much money on the safety features. And they're designed to work, right? <laughs> right. So, so, the, so, so that's the argument that I personally find right now uh, the most explanatory in terms of why the actual facts are so divorced from the fear narratives that you have is that this bridging of, uh, of hyper conservatism in nuclear safety applications uh, is not something that the, the public is aware of. Uh, here's an example. If you were to go and get a CT scan of your hip or your torso or your head, that would give you about a dose of a REM, right? Okay. And any physician would say, you know, if that was what was prescribed, then that's what you should do, right? If it was prescribed, if the physician said, I need to see what's going on in your bowels right, because you've got some medical condition and we need to do that and it's better than cutting you flat out, Right. The right. risk from the radiation is much better than cutting you. So everybody would say, yes, you know, this is outpatient, gives you this small dose. But at one REM, if you got that in a year, instead of, you know, in a, in a, in a 20 second CT scan, if you got that in a year right now, the EPA would be able to issue recommendation guidance that you should evacuate at one <laughs> REM. Right. Right. And so there's this cognitive dissonance where you say it's not that big of a deal. We're just being conservative. And then the cognitive dissonance comes in and says, well, if you're being conservative, why are you making me move? Why are you making me move completely from my house? Does that make sense? That doesn't make sense. And at five RAM, so from one to five RAM is where they would issue that guidance. At five RAM, that's the maximum that they would say that a, that a, a governor would allow people not to have to move. At five RAM, they would say, you really need to make people move. That's our, that's our recommendation is you make people move. Uh, if it's five RAM over a year, from any kind of radioactive contamination. But 5 gram, that's a legal dose for a radiation worker okay. in the United States because it's still considered safe. It's just that now because that's a that, that dose is something that somebody would incur that they didn't ask for, right? You're not getting paid for it as a radiation worker. The government, again, issues hyper-conservative uh, uh, approach saying, we want you to move, permanently move from your house uh, and evacuate. And that would be their recommendation even though it's not until 10 RAM that you just start to get at just the threshold of where you can statistically measure, measure uh, me any kind of medical effects. And that's only for children. It's about 20 RAM for adults. And there it's just a very tiny, small statistical increase. But the point is, is that we have the, 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 the regulations and the guidance is well below that. So that you're not getting 5 RAM here and 5 RAM there and 5 RAM here and 5 RAM there so that you actually could get measurable medical effects, but even then it's extremely small. And all of that effort is to prevent this extremely small effect. And people are like, well, if it's such an extremely small effect, why do you have such a drastic response to it? It's because people are so afraid of it that we build them to be that safe and we issue the kind of guidance to keep people that safe because they're so afraid of it. And it's just like catch 22. Once we give them all of the safety that they ask for, then that gives us perception that is needed. And it's not just to placate you and make you feel better that it was required as much as say seatbelts or uh, uh, safety inspections on cars. Yeah. Even though those really uh, do save lives, but there are still many, many lives that are being lost because we don't have the same kind of safety criteria when it comes to cars as it does to, to nuclear reactors or nuclear technology. And so being able to bridge that gap with information is, is it, in my opinion, that's really what's going on. And again, that's kind of a minority opinion because this is new research. At least it was new to me when, when I heard it, that Malcolm Grissom came out with, uh, that it's because the people that are communicating the facts are thinking engineering and science and STEM. This is the facts. This is what's observable. This is the evidence, but they're not speaking to common sense. Yeah. They're not about this, this gut approach to assess whether information is reliable or not. They're talking, this is what we can measure. This is what we can prove. Adopt it. <laughs> yeah. And that, and that doesn't sound like that's a news story that can be sold at the seven o'clock news, you know? Maybe. 
Yeah. Well, you know, ironically, I found out about you um, on on TikTok and you put out these TikTok videos. They're very informative. I learned a lot from them already. But, you know, one of the ones that stuck out to me was one about your uh, about your faith. Um, You said you said you're a very devout Christian. And one of the comments that came up was, how can you be a scientist and a Christian as well? And I was amazed that you even had to make that video. I'm amazed that we're even at that point where um, someone I think someone just saw happened to see a cross in your house and they couldn't understand how a scientist could also be could also believe in God. Um, Do you find that often? Do you have to defend or explain your faith? that often or is that something that pops up it, it's something that comes up on the account so <clears throat> i was doing tiktok during lockdown and during lockdown um i had to do the videos in my home <laughs> yeah right <laughs> and i happen to have a unique taste of decor and i like you know different designs of crosses right cowboy crosses uh, uh flower crosses um uh orthodox crosses uh i like a lot of different kind and I like the design of them. So I decorate my house with them. Sure. And because they would appear in the videos, I would regularly get trolls, a large uh, array of them that would, that would say, you can't be a Christian and a scientist. I'm like, you, you know, the scientific community doesn't really agree with that. Right. I've never <laughs> found that. Obviously uh, there are people in the scientific community that would prefer other people to have the same worldview that they do. Right. And, and it's usually not religion, but it can be. And yeah. it turns out from my experience that I do get a lot of uh, people that would criticize me for that. And at first I just ignored it um, until it just kept going and kept going until finally I thought, you know, I'm just going to address one, uh, but I'm going to try to do it in a way that's both respectful and that's meaningful and that hopefully um, uh, will communicate why it makes sense that you can, that you know that to me religion in terms of science is like saying you have to have a certain height yeah right like right or, or a certain skin color or a certain age um you know it's uh those things really are not in my opinion uh directly related right it might help to be a certain age uh it might help uh to be of a certain economic status right so that you could get a phd um but none of that's required uh, yeah. You just got to be able to to love science and have a passion for it and pursue it uh, relentlessly. And in my experience, that eventually turns you into a scientist because you start making discoveries and publishing them. I was wondering because I've heard that there's sort of a narrative. We were talking about narratives earlier. Um, I've heard that there's sort of a, a narrative that there's this sort of science versus religion argument. But you're saying there's not really that at all. You don't really see that. So I, I think that that comes from there is a, a certain group of individuals who try to uh, interpret the Bible literally from their perspective. Yeah. And so their interpretation of, uh, uh, the, uh, of the Bible literally doesn't agree with, you know, a lot of other Christians like orthodoxy and um, other Christian groups that would say, you know, this is figurative and this is literal. And then if you pick, if you choose different things to be figurative and literal, you come up with very different narratives. Right. Does that make sense? Sure. And so um, I, I, I think that that's part of it. Uh, I think the other part is that uh, it seems to me, and I could be wrong, it seems to me that, the, that those that are very vocal about atheism tend to think that that is a superior worldview and that it's because it's better than all other worldviews, everybody needs to adopt it. Again, right. I would I would think that that's, I would hope that that's really the minority in that camp, but they're just really vocal. And so it, I really couldn't tell you uh, um, uh, to the extent that that's representative, but uh, they are the ones that uh, make the comment. So they're the ones that are the most uh, interactive uh, about trying to proselytize uh, their secularism. Yeah. They do say that the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, I, I, I find it very interesting, this, this whole topic, you know, um, another thing that I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, I've also heard that there are other, I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I, I don't think that there's the separation that we were just talking about. I think, I think that, um, science in itself 
the scientific method in itself, I think, almost aligns for people to dis- either discover their faith or strengthen their faith as well. But um, I've heard that there are a lot of people that choose to censor their beliefs or feel that they have to censor their beliefs because of um, the because of academia recently. I mean, have you noticed that at all, or do you think that's do you think that's an issue that actually pops up? I, I have not, but I would not say that that doesn't occur. Um, uh, I would put, I would actually put this up, uh, uh, offer this. Um, I think it's more cause I've had people on my TikTok that would say to me, but it biases your results. It, it biases the way that you look at things if you're a Christian. And so therefore you're biased against the truth. And I would think it's just the opposite. Uh, right. Uh, it, if I believe the truth is objective, how am I going to treat it when I see it? But if I tra- think truth is subjective, as in a secular humanist, how am I going to treat it when I see it? If, if it's subjective, then I can interpret it how I want and I can report it how I want. But if I think it's objective, like a Christian would, then I'm going to embrace it, whatever it is. And so right. if you walk down that road, I would argue that it's actually the person that believes the truth is objective that's going to be the more reliable scientist than somebody that believes the truth is subjective because you don't know how that subjectivity is going to fall into when they report their results. And that I would say is an issue. If you think the truth is subjective and you're going to try to present the truth, then I'm going to ask which truth are you presenting here? Right. But if you think truth is objective and that doesn't matter what you, your, what, what your worldview is, truth is truth. Then I'm going to be much more comfortable in you saying, this is the measurement that I got. And this is the results that I got. That's going to make a lot more sense to me. That would be my own personal perspective on the utility or uh, antagonism that might uh, uh, come in with secular humanism versus uh, a religious worldview, because I think they're kind of both religious worldviews. Uh, But if you're taking one group of people that thinks the truth is objective versus those that think the truth is subjective, I could see that there could be issues there. I think that oftentimes I I hear the reason that we hear about stuff like that is because of tenure. Um, Could you explain tenure a little bit? Because it seems like that's like the golden ticket to where once you've, well, let's, let's hear it from, from, from your perspective, as far as tenure goes, can you explain that to somebody that's not really familiar with that and how that applies to your sort of freedom of, of, of your expression and your research? The narrative that we tell ourselves in faculty is that tenure is your license to speak truth to power. Okay. So my research uh, may very well, especially it it actually is kind of acutely true in my research. My research could contradict popular narratives in the decision-maker arenas, in the political realm. And so if I have tenure, that's supposed to protect me from saying my research contradicts you, decision maker. You might say that nuclear is evil and bad because it's going to kill the world, but my research says you're wrong and it's not going to kill the world. If anything, it's going to save us. Yeah. And here's the facts. And tenure basically says, and you can't do anything about shutting me up because I have tenure. Right. That's how it's supposed to work. Yeah. Is that how it works? Is that you said that you said that that's how it's supposed to work? Right. <laughs> is there is there an alternative to how it actually plays out? <laughs> I'm I'm not putting you into the fire. I'm out of the frying pan. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, uh, I actually did have a, 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 a con- confrontation with cancel culture. Oh, wow. um, it was because of my TikTok channel as well. So. <laughs> I get trolls, right? You get people that say crazy things. And I had one person. So I I, I did a a video on thorium reactors, thorium technology, right? And so that does fall, certain parts of that do fall within my teaching and research, um, which is why I did a TikTok on it. And one of of these people made, made, made a statement that basically said, the reason we don't have thorium reactors is because we have transgender bathrooms. Oh my gosh. And... I just thought that was hilarious, right? (laughs) I did. I thought it was just flat out hilarious. And I thought to myself, this does not deserve a professional, you know, um, uh, uh, articulate response as to 
how what is required to get thorium reactors and uh, what, if anything, transgender bathrooms might have to do with the technology and adopting the technology. So what I thought to myself was the only response that this really warrants is what would an actual expert say or respond to that comment? And I was still laughing when I was thinking about this. And I thought that's the perfect response. How would an expert respond? They would respond in hilarity to that comment, right? So (laughs) while I was laughing, looking at this comment, I recorded myself laughing at that comment, right? Oh, no. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Because, and and I actually did a filter because I I, I actually served for a couple of years on the faculty senate. And that was always the way that I would I would gauge my response. I thought, is this something I would be perfectly comfortable allowing every one of them to see? And I thought, oh yeah, they would yeah. like this. <laughs> oh they yeah, they would like this, right? So I was like, yeah. So if my colleagues would all uh, endorse it, I'm good with it. Right. And it was the only video that just went crazy viral. Oh wow! Right? Of course. Apparently, it, it resonated with people to see an expert respond to this comment, just laughing at it. Wow. Um, but then somebody took a screenshot of that, took a screenshot of my TikTok pro- profile, sent it to the chancellor, to the, the university, which went to the chancellor, to the dean, to my department head. And the email came back saying, basically they said, oh, it looks like you have a faculty member who's transphobic. God. And so the email came back, said, we need to talk about this right away. Yeah, right. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, I don't care. I'll just take it down. I'm not going to fight this battle. You know, if you're going to, if that's the response I'm going to get, I'm not even going to go. I'm not even going to try. I give up and I took it down. And then they said, strip your TikTok account from anything that states that you're NC State faculty. um, And then we'll have legal look at it. I was like, whatever. Oh, my God. I don't even see their logic. (laughs) Was because they didn't understand the the dynamic that was going on, that I was laughing at this comment. They, uh, my guess is that they thought, I was laughing because it was true. Oh. And it was like, how could you? All right, whatever. Just the accusation. The point is, is the accusation was enough. That was it. Just the accusation. Got that kind of a response. And it was like, wow. All right. You know, clearly those two things have have everything in common. (laughs) It makes no sense whatsoever. Well, I'm sorry you had to go through that. I mean, it, it, it just... I think it's just a sign of the times, you know, but I, I'm really happy that you do have a TikTok account in general. You know, social media makes it so much more, so much easier to sort of get a new audience. And clearly you have, I mean, I, I won't say that I'm like super involved in, in nuclear engineering, but I learned a lot from your TikTok and I don't think that I'm somebody that you might have, um, you might have interacted with without some type of social media platform. Do you think that there's more of a need for education to, or or educators to interact with social media to sort of pull people together that wouldn't necessarily have an interest in that? So um, this actually wasn't per se my idea. Um, What happened was, so I teach a number of graduate courses and in when you're doing a graduate courses, it's common in engineering to require a research project as part of the course, right? So you, you learn a bunch of new technical content. Now you have to do research. You actually have to go and bring new knowledge into existence um, by going out and testing some hypotheses. Um, and so because uh, at, at NC State, we have a very high degree of quality expectation, um, I'm able to tell the students uh, for your research project, you have to, use, you have to do a grand challenge you have to pick a topic from the grand challenge from the American Nuclear Society. Okay. Um, which, which means by definitions, it's really going to be hard, right? Yeah. Uh, and often for the subjects that I teach, right? Radiation safety, um, uh, radiological health, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, the students would often pick one of the grand challenges, which was public communication. It's like, how do you deal with public communication, right? Right. And... I started to say, I've been doing this for years. And for those students, they, they, they gave some great ideas, right? These are brilliant graduate students. They were giving these great ideas, but none of them were being implemented. It was like, yeah, that'd be fantastic if that were to occur. 
and they give the the research on you know the uh, uh, on what's been done to validate this in other realms, or even what's been done in these realms in terms of nuclear education. And almost invariably, they all say providing the public with facts is not going to do it. The facts have always been there, and it gotten us where we are today. Just providing the facts. Sure. Right. And so what the students would do is come up with these different perspectives on why that's not okay to give people facts and yet have them be so terrified that they'll risk their life and some of them will lose it to avoid something that's not even a measurable, won't even give you a measurable medical effect. Right. That's what radiophobia does. So uh, the commonality that I saw was that they needed somebody that was in the social media realm that was an influencer or a trusted source that could bridge that gap of, it, of describing why it is that uh, that nuclear uh, actually does conform to the facts and empirical science that's being promoted by the scientific community, as opposed to the common public narrative that's out there. Yeah, and um, and so one day I just thought, you know, nobody's doing this. And even my students weren't doing it, right? They'd write their paper, they'd get graded, and then that was the end of it. Um, and I thought, maybe I need to do it. Yeah. Uh, if the students aren't doing it, right, they're getting these great ideas, I could use these ideas and put them to practice. And what it was is that I I was going to wait until, because I'm uh, the, my social media at my age is Facebook. <laughs> right. <laughs> my generation is Facebook. Um, so I was going to wait until Facebook came out with a competitor to TikTok, right? Because I, I knew that at the time there was this talk about the United States was going to ban TikTok. And I was like, all right, whatever. I'll just use whatever, you know, if, if Facebook comes up with one, I'm there, right? I could do Facebook. I know Facebook. Right. <laughs> um, but Facebook never came out with one. And so what ended up happening is I have a son. Uh, apparently he's got my crazy genes uh, and he's got a viral TikTok channel. Right now, I think he's got almost a million followers. Oh, wow. Um, but uh, he talked me into it. He said, Dad, you need to get into it now because first to market gets lion's share. And the sooner you get in, the sooner you're going to be able to train that algorithm that anybody that wants nuclear information, they're going to get fed your channel. And so uh, that was basically the straw that broke the camel's back. And I said, yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, even if TikTok gets banned, at least the algorithm will start to get trained now. And so that was when I started making TikToks. Well, I'm so glad that you did. I mean, it, it's it's very interesting what you do, and I think you're reaching an entire new generation of people that, like I said, I I, I don't know, I don't know how, how many times your average TikTok user is going to go search up for nuclear energy, but the fact that I happened upon you out of the blue, um, I, I think it's I think it's great. I love what you're doing, man, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, your 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 videos are are informative and fun. So thanks. Keep up Thank the good you. work. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, we're winding down towards the end of the episode. And at the end of every episode, I kind of spring something on people. So good luck. <laughs> but um, I ask everybody one question. It's one question in two parts. So what was the last goal that you completed? And what's the next goal that you want to set for yourself? Oh, dear. You're going to see how nerdy I am. The last <laughs> goal that I accomplished was publishing a theory on neutrino oscillation showing that neutrinos oscillation can be done with massless neutrinos using entanglement that if a neutrino is born in it with its flavor entangled that flavor can oscillate because whatever it was entangled with can get entangled with other things causing the entanglement to be shared across different particles with different flavors and that would give rise to neutron neutrino oscillations which currently is the strongest argument for new physics. Well, that sounds amazing, but I got about a G out of what you just said. <laughs> so I published that theory. My next one was I published it in another, I, I published another theory that, uh, that was explaining dark energy and uh, cosmic inflation. Um, but I, I published it in a, in a, in a, a, a really low quality journal because, uh, I just wanted to get it published. My next goal would be to rewrite that and, uh, improve it, polish it and substantially strengthen the arguments in that theory and get that published. Can you explain it just a little bit for sure. people that aren't familiar? If I take this, this thumb drive and this mouse 
and I push them together, they don't pass through each other, even though they're mostly space. They're basically 99% space, but they don't pass through each other. Sure. And the reason why is it's something that's called the Pauli exclusion principle. The outer valence electrons, uh, they're going to be paired. And <clears throat> those outer valence electrons, uh, they can't have all the same quantum numbers as any other electron if they're, if they're in the same space. And so it acts like a force preventing my hands from passing through each other even. Okay. But those valence electrons on the outside of, of my, my hand uh, can't have the same quantum numbers and therefore they can't pass through it. So it acts like a force pushing them apart. So when it comes to inflation, basically the Big Bang, um, all you have to uh, posit is that all the laws of physics are there at the initial singularity and that uh, everything uh, that exists existed at the initial singularity. And that means that any kind of a fermion, which would be an electron or a neutrino, that they or their progenitors were present and that they were fermions. If there were in that initial singularity fermions, then the Pauli exclusion principle exists because we did posit that all physics exists and all that exists exists. And at fermions, if there, there is a conservation law of fermions, they're always going to be the same number of fermions. So there had to be the same number then. The fermions would then be subject to the Pauli exclusion principle. So they would therefore have to move. They would be a force that would take them from being overlapping to no, non-overlapping. If you then posit that this takes place in what's called the quark time, it would be the minimum amount of incremental time that you can quantize that that takes place, then they all travel faster than light. They travel faster than light as they come apart, and that continues to occur until you have uh, 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 until they're sufficiently far apart that they're not overlapping, and the Pauli exclusion principle is no longer forcing them apart. So these things travel apart at the speed of light, effectively substantially higher than that, which gives rise to inflation. That's why everything expanded so fast is simply because it's like the the neutrino thing. It's just the standard model physics. You don't need new physics. It's just old physics. You just need all of it. And then there's a similar argument for how you can get uh, a dark energy using just modern physics. You don't need to appeal to new physics. Modern physics is sufficient to explain it in this theory that I want to redo and get republished in uh, uh, a higher profile journal. So that'd be, that'd be my next goal. My first goal was the neutrino theory that got published in a decent, was uh, published in the Journal of Modern Physics. Uh, the next one would be the inflation and or the dark energy theory in uh, a much higher uh, pedigree journal. Awesome. Well, I am glad that you are doing this work because the, you're, you're, you're a smarter man than I am. I'm just going to let you know. <laughs> I, I, I would not say that I'm smarter. I would say that I've studied a lot longer. <laughs> okay. Okay. More experienced. We'll call it that. I appreciate okay. that. I appreciate that. Well, um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I really think that, you know, the work that you're doing and the way that you are doing it and the method in which you are uh, reaching new people is really, a, really a good thing. And it's, it's really a positive, uh, a positive force for educators and education in the future and science in the future. I think you're bringing it to a whole new people whole new group of people. And I'm just very excited for the things that you're doing in the future. So thank you again for coming on and talking to me. I know you're a busy guy, so I'm going to let you get back to it. And, um, and misfits, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this podcast up. Thank you so much for listening and you have a great afternoon. Well, misfits, we did it. That's our episode. I want to thank you so much for listening and thanks again to our sponsors. If you want to support any of the sponsors of this podcast, there are affiliate links on the sponsors tab of our website over at www.misfit-heroes.com. You can also find links to all of our social media there, so follow us for immediate up-to-date info about the podcast. Please, if you enjoyed this podcast and you want to help me out, do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button down below so you're notified of new episodes as they're released, and make sure to leave a rating or review of the show on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. Truly Misfits, I love you. Thank you so much for listening. And until the next episode, be kind, love one another, and be a hero.